Welcome to a bonus episode of The Favorites. I'm Darren Ravel. I know I'm not your usual host of the show, but today I got a chance to talk to Jeopardy James Holzhauer, who has won over a million dollars in 20 straight wins on the show, and we figured that that alone was worth a bonus episode. He caught my attention for a very specific reason. He uses his experience as a sports better to guide how to crack the game of Jeopardy, and that's what we talked about in this show, along with how he uses the Jeopardy buzzer, the last sports bet he ever made, and how he generally fares as a sports better. So I spoke to him over Skype on Wednesday. Take a listen. I'm Darren Ravel with the Action Network, and we welcome in Jeopardy! champion James Holzhauer, uh, who through Wednesday has won $1.52 million on 20 straight appearances. It's the third longest run of all time, only second money-wise to Ken Jennings, who won about a million dollars more, but he had 74 appearances uh, 15 years ago consecutively. James, thanks for joining us. I see you're in uh, actually a Cubs jersey. Know you're originally from Naperville, went to University of Illinois, uh, math major. Uh, let's get into uh, first of all, how is it for you? What does it feel like? Because obviously you're taping these shows. I think you tape like five a day or something like that, so you know everything. It's almost like The Bachelor. Uh, <laughs> what it, what is it? What is it like? to watch it later and see the whole country watch it in a time that we live in where almost everything is live. You know, I think it's really great that uh, the audience kept mum about it. And, you know, it seems like everyone's really being clued in. It wasn't that hard for me to keep the secret, but I know my daughter is terrible with secrets. So I kind of had to make up a story to her that I was going to LA for work, which uh, she she's four years old. So she doesn't question why a pro gambler needs to fly from Vegas to LA to go do work. <laughs> Nice. So uh, one of the things that I read was that before you uh, played the game, you essentially asked some questions about the buzzer in particular. Uh, how yeah. important How important is the buzzer? Because I know when I was at Northwestern, I actually tried out for the college show and I could not get the buzzer right. And I was automatically had no shot. So tell yeah. me how how important the buzzer is. So. Being on Jeopardy, I would say, is, is mostly about your trivial knowledge, but the people who appear on the show have all passed the same test. They all can do most of the questions on the board, so the buzzer becomes most of the game then. You know, you you see on TV, everyone's ringing in on most questions, and, you know, it's whoever wins the race that gets there. So I knew that would be the critical thing, and I tried to do all the research I could ahead of time. There's an ebook that I read by a former champion with great <laughs> advice there. And I actually emailed him and he told me uh, to ask the producer before I went on about some questions, exactly how long. If you buzz in too early, they lock you out for a quarter of a second. And I, I had some really specific questions about like, let's say I hammer the buzzer five times and I locked out for uh, now five quarters of a second. And <laughs> she, she kept like looking at me like, who is this guy? You know, why does he right. have such art? So it actually act. I just want to make sure that that our 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 listeners and viewers know. So as soon as Alex Alex Trebek stops talking, that's when it like that's when you got to get in. It's not entirely key to his voice. They have a human who actually has to activate uh, the buzzing system, uh, but he that human person is going off of Alex's voice, so he's trying to match the end of the question and. But, you know, the human timing is another element to it that you have to kind of practice that. They do give you practices at the start of the taping day. So I'm not trying to get into too minutia, but it's when a light pops on the. How do you then know? Yeah, there's a if you go to Jeopardy.com, they have a picture of the set and you'll see they have a kind of a gift with blinking lights around the game board. You can only see them at, uh, on the stage, not at home, uh, but they come on when the buzzer is activated and. You, you have to decide for yourself whether you want to try to time Alex's voice or time the lights. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, I guess after you spoke to that person, before you got on the show, how much did you practice the buzzer? A pretty good amount. You know, I had a tape a buzzer I made out of wrapping masking tape around a mechanical pencil to try to simulate the heft of it. I didn't even really come that close, but at least... You know, I had something to go off of, and I practiced standing around in my dress shoes like I would be on the show. Uh, I tried different poses of holding the buzzer. I eventually went with a kind of folded arms and fold it uh, in this hand, try to eliminate wasted motion, as the the author of the ebook says. It's like a baseball player, you know. If you have a hitch and you're swinging, it works for you great, but it's probably better to eliminate the hitch. 
Okay, so it's the buzzer. It's the buzzer speed. I assume you you cut down on that. You're able to hit it in the right place. Now let's talk. Obviously, uh, we cover sports gambling. Uh, how much does being a sports gambler come into play with your strategy? Anyone who watches the show knows you do math so quickly. So the idea, basically, and you're again, you're a math major. So the idea basically is to go as much as you can to wager as much as you can without putting yourself in jeopardy of uh, of of kind of coming into play with where the other people are. Um, so how do you, I mean, I guess you've always had a math uh, penchant for math and you got better. You're actually doing those calculations in your head. Yeah, I suppose there's two big things uh, where the work comes into play. The first is just that, you know, the way I approach my work, I'm looking for advantages I can have that the average better doesn't. And, you know, so I came into this thinking, like, what can I do differently than the average contestant to give myself that edge? And the second thing, of course, is that I can wager five figures worth of money and not be feeling too much pressure about it. You know, to me, this is just like a coin flip that's heavily weighted uh, on my side. And I want to get in as much money as I can on that coin. Uh, whereas I think your average contestant might be sweating, uh, you know, and if they can't concentrate on a trivia question with too much money is at risk, then that's, you know, going to be too much trouble for them. They really shouldn't be betting that much then. So you're, 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 you're so good at the pressure. You figure out the math. Uh, I need to ask you about being a sports gambler in general, because it seems like you're, you said that it's akin to being a day trader, which to me suggested that you're jumping on the early lines made by bookmakers. Uh, is that what you do? Is that your thing? And is there a particular sport? Yeah. So, you know, I people are much more familiar with finance than uh, sports betting in general. So I kind of liken these things to different terms from the finance world. You know, I think that I uh, often bet on futures. And I think that to me is kind of like running a hedge fund. You know, you're going long short on some teams and certain ways you can find a, a market where they're underpriced and a market where they're overpriced. Um, I do often jump on the early lines and try to trade out of those positions, either in game or uh, when the market moves, although a lot of sports books don't like you doing that. So uh, it's kind of the most important thing is just to make sure you stay on their good side. It's it seems like uh, you said the day where you don't necessarily get to see your daughter's Saturday. Is that are you big into college football? You know, I work from home uh, thanks to the apps. I can bet from home and it's easy to line shop and things like that. And sometimes my daughter will be running around. And, you know, if it's not like halftime of a bunch of different college games, I usually will take a break to play something with her. But it's Saturday's a pretty hard day in my whole family. My wife often has to try and take the kid out of the house for as long as she can. You used to run a poker strategy website. Is there anything specifically poker about your game? You know, I think that one thing is playing tournament poker. You recognize that people who jump off to an early edge get the advantages of playing with a big stack. You know, if you're the chip leader in a no-limit tournament, you're the only person who can't go broke on the next hand, which really has a lot of strategic advantages. And I thought that uh, I expanded that to my play. I'm the first person I know of who immediately goes for the $1,000 clues in single jeopardy, tries to build a stack before hitting any of the daily doubles. And I think that might come from poker tournament experience. Uh, okay, so what about the people who you're competing against? As you've gone to, so now we're through 20, as, as le at least what we know, uh, have you felt that the people standing next to you feel more pressure? Is it palpable? You know, some of them I think did, but some of them have really risen to the occasion. Adam on Monday's episode played like a real champion. You know, I feel a little bad for him because he should have been winning seven episodes if he faced any lesser competition right. than he did. Uh, there was Satish in my second game. He played a great game against me. And, uh, you know, maybe if I hadn't hit that daily double against him, he would be the super champ everyone's talking about. So people will talk about these are all blowout victories, but really almost every episode you can point to one point where if I didn't get a big daily double right or if someone else hit it, things could have gone very differently. How would you describe how successful you are as a sports better? Uh, well, I'm not making the Billy Walters money, but, you know, I'm comfortable. <laughs> and the important thing, I think, is that I can take time off whenever I want. You know, when it gets to be 105 degrees outside in Vegas and baseball is the only sport in town, I'm often, you know, taking a vacation. And I really appreciate that I have the freedom to do that. Uh, what was the last bet 
that you made? I mean, I, are you are you betting now during this run, or what was the last bet that you made? I have taken the last few weeks off because there's too much else going on, and really there's not as many sports to bet on. Um, but I made a lot of prop bets during the NCAA tournament that did not go so well. Uh, yeah, there. I'm sure your listeners what? are familiar with Polish middles. There were a lot of uh, games where I would find a the underdog on the money line and the favorite minus two and a half or something, and the favorite would win by exactly two. That happened like four times in that tournament. Uh, so. <laughs> but you did you have a good tournament though? No, it uh, did not go great overall. But it you know, was not other, great. I knew that there were other things happening in my life. Uh, oh, and the the Super Bowl was right before I started taping Jeopardy, and uh, you know. The pros love to make props on, will this be a boring Super Bowl, yes or no? And you bet the yes on uh, boring everything. <laughs> so that was a wonderful Super Bowl for me. Uh, uh, now, since we're talking about money, I, I have to ask you, how does the payment work for Jeopardy? Like, so it's $1.5 million. Like, do you get it after the show airs? Do you get it eventually? How does that work? I've always been curious about that. My understanding is that 120 days after my last episode goes to air, I'll receive a lump sum payment from them. Uh, I did think that they told me that Ken Jennings got a separate check uh, because his run overlapped two seasons. I think he got a one check when the first season ended. So if that happens to me, maybe I can expect that too. But I don't know. I know I haven't been paid yet. Uh, what do you plan to do with your winnings? So I've already started giving some to some local charitable causes that I think are important to me, particularly ones that deal with children, Uh, the Natural History Museum, the local food bank, Three Square, uh, the library system. They're, you know, not only do I love the library, but they were invaluable in helping me prepare for the show. So I'm very thankful to them. Um, Let's see. I want to send my dad and my stepmom to the U.S. Open because they've been wanting to go for a long time. And uh, I noticed my dad first said he would just uh, take the, the grounds ticket to get in, but now he's uh, wanting to go to Ash Stadium, and maybe he'll be wanting to so, go to center court pretty soon. <laughs> so the, the, the tennis U.S. Open for in April, in uh, August and September. Yeah. Do you, how have you become famous? Like, are you out and about? Do you realize how famous you are? Do people stop you with each day? Does it get uh, uh, more noticeable? I would say the average time I go out of the house, uh, at least one or two people will say hi to me, shake my hand, something like that. I'll see a lot of uh, pointing. Um, but the one time it re- people really got in my face about it was when I was at the Knights game uh, where I cranked the siren. And uh, there I was on the big screen, so everybody knew who I was there. And I, I didn't have my kid with me, so a lot of people were stopping me for photos. I'm thankful that nobody is stopping me for a photo when I have my kid because, you know, if I let her go for five seconds, she's going to run away. <laughs> so. Um, I think the fans were probably more inebriated in the hockey game than they would be otherwise, too. But they've um, almost all been very respectful, so I'm appreciative of that. What did you think of the Washington Post calling you a menace to, a menace to the game? I mean, that was you know, pretty crazy. I try not to take those things too personally. It seemed uh, like a rather silly take. But, you know, if you want to drive clicks to your site, you can't write the, the 100th article on how good James is doing. You have to be the first one to write something like that. So. And, you know, I know something. Just I know something about that method a little bit. Yeah, I, I, I'm not going for a hundred percent approval rating. I would never be happy. Uh, can you disclose how many you've taped or no? Uh, no, I don't think that's. Uh... Okay. Okay. Uh, so my last question is: How hard is it going to be to get down the money now that you need to get down <laughs> because you're you're so recognizable? I will say that the. Uh... Bookmakers I've talked to, uh, okay, I should say the lines managers I've talked to at the sports books when I come to when I came to cash some tickets for the NCAA's, they shook my hand, said they were rooting for me. So I don't think it'll be too different than it was. You know, I was already 86 from half the places in town before this all started, and <laughs> I doubt they'll be inviting me back now. But I think the places that still welcome my action, they all know I'm pro. You know, they're not dumb, and you know, they're probably, uh, if anything, it'd be good publicity to have me be seen there now. So, will you go in? If it if it takes that, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, I try to bet through the apps if I can, but of course they'll take more money over the counter than they will uh, on the phone. So sometimes I just need to go in person just to get more money down on something. Can I ask you a couple quiz questions on betting? Sure. 
All right. How much does a two team money line parlay of two standard minus one ten bets pay? Okay, so I think the true odds are supposed to be like plus two sixty four or something, but they really give you plus two sixty, uh, is that right? That is that is that is correct. Okay. Uh, okay. Who hit the infamous uh half court shot for Duke? Uh, in the final four that led to the backdoor cover? That was Chris Duhon. There you go. Uh, which two teams combined to score 75 second half points in the Super Bowl in 1995? Okay, let's see. 1995, I guess I can probably figure this out just from the year. So that'd be Super Bowl 29. It'd have to be the Niners and Chargers? Correct. Okay, here we go. Uh, what is the Patriots against the spread record in their nine Super Bowls since 2000? Uh, so I'm not counting. No, not not Super Bowl 20. Okay, let's see. They covered this year uh, against the Eagles. I feel like they had never covered except there was a push um, against the Eagles. So I'm going to say one seven and one. We have four and five, but I'm going to have to go back and check that. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to. Oh, no. That, obviously, they covered against the Rams. I forgot about that one. So, so well, sure okay. Okay. Uh, within three points, how many points was Appalachian State getting uh, in its famous upset against Michigan in 2007? Oh, I feel like most sports books didn't even have a line on this. I'm going to say. That is true. I'm going to say 39. It was 33, but I oh. like that. Um, what were the odds of Leicester City to win the Premier League before the season that they won? 5,000 to 1. That one I remember. There you go. I was there that day. It was it was crazier than Wrigley when I was in Wrigleyville when the Cubs won it all. And that wow. was insane. Uh, which state was the first state to legalize single-game sports betting after the Supreme Court ruling last May? Mm, not sure. Was it New Jersey? It was Delaware. That was my trick uh, question. <laughs> Which 50 to 1 Kentucky Derby winner in 2009 became the biggest long shot to win since Donna Rail in 1913? Oh, what was that? What was his name? Uh, was it Mind That Bird? It was. Excellent. Uh, and my last question for you. Which early 2000s World Series winner did Phil Mickelson famously put $20,000 on at 38 to 1 odds? 38 to 1. Okay, so it'd have to be a surprise team uh, that era. Uh, let's say it was the Marlins. It was the Diamondbacks in 2001. Oh, wow. Surprised they were getting those odds. Crazy. <laughs> Jane. James, thank you so much for for uh, doing this interview. Uh, you're a pretty hard guy to get, and congratulations on everything. It is, it's awesome to watch. It's addictive, and every night, at least at seven o'clock in New York, uh, I am there watching. So, good luck. You might have been done already, but I love the mystery of it all. And yeah. uh, and thanks for coming on with us at the Action Network. Okay, thank you for having me, Darren. It was a pleasure. Thanks to James Holzhauer for joining us. Keep watching him as he goes for those records on Jeopardy. And please share this with your friends and give our podcast a rating and a review. Chad and Blackjack will be back next week. Till then, I'm Darren Ravel for the Action Network, and this is The Favorites.